So, um, as Dian said, um, I'm Luis and I'm a biologist. I was uh, studying with, uh, when I was in, in the bachelor, bachelor, I was studying uh, bioethics and research ethics involving uh, people, uh, research with people with sickle cell disease. And then I had a personal experience with ayahuasca and uh, basically uh, this experience uh, was very nice and grabbed my attention and I started uh, this interest on understanding a little bit about the bioethics of ayahuasca use. So I did my master's at my hometown, São José do Rio Preto, in a uh, 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 in university called FAMERP, and medical university. And this this master's in, in this master's, I studied the the informed consent process on ayahuasca groups, mostly Santo Daime and neo shamanic groups. And um, later, when when I when I finished at the masters, I moved to Campinas, uh, where I met Dian in the the interdisciplinary the, co the course interdisciplinary perspectives of ayahuasca. Um, and I started my in 2019 my PhD here uh, in collective health, which is uh, somehow similar to public health. Uh, it's more common in, in this area, it's more common in Latin American and Global South uh, contexts, but it's, it's also known as public health too. So now I'm, I'm interested in my PhD in comprehending the, the ethics and safety in different ayahuasca groups um, and also the care with ayahuasca. So uh, I'm also a member of ICARO, the Inter Interdisciplinary Cooperation for Ayahuasca Research and Outreach. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ICARO and the Unicamp here. Uh, in this photo, you can see the, our campus. Um, it, it is located at the city of Campinas in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. We are like in an hour from, from the city of Sao Paulo uh, by car. And the ICARO is an interdisciplinary laboratory. Um, we have like physicians, biologists, artists, um, sociologists, um, psychologists. Uh, there are multiple. Um, people in the in the group and we 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 try to 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 contribute with ayahuasca research with this interdisciplinary approach being um, being next to the to the ayahuasca groups and and being and and, and doing a, a dialogue trying to do a dialogue between uh, what we, we see from these practices, from these ritual practices, and what we see in and 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 what we research in the, the with health, and so that's uh, a little bit about Ikaru. So uh, this is a summary of this presentation. I'm going to do a brief uh, introduction about ayahuasca and bioethics. Then I'm going to, to talk a little bit about my, my master's research, which, it, what, which was about the informed consent process in the religious and ritual context of ayahuasca usage. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about research ethics involving ayahuasca administration, and then we'll go to reflections and conclusions. So, um, as you may know, ayahuasca uh, use is uh, pretty diverse. We have uh, several 
uh, indigenous groups. We have several names to call ayahuasca. We have uh, different traditional religion groups like uh, Santo Daime, Unión do Vegetal, Barquinha. And um, also we have uh, practices like the this uh, urban ayahuasca circles, which are also called neo shamanic or neo ayahuasqueros. And um, so in this image here, I, I try to represent a little bit of, of this diversity. Um, but also I would like to call attention uh, for this, for the, the, the fact that um, only the fact of drinking ayahuasca doesn't make this, these groups uh, homogeneous, as they may look for people who are uh, trying to understand the, the, the ayahuasca use or that are uh, having their first contact with ayahuasca ritual use. Um, they are pretty diverse, as I said, and also they uh, sometimes when like when ayahuasca use is threatened, the, the legality of the ayahuasca use is threatened. Um, maybe we can see like the, the, this, this uh, major ayahuasca community at, uh, Advoking, ad, advoking about the, the ayahuasca use and organizing them, themselves to, to defend ayahuasca. But also we have a lot of tensions between them um, regarding specific beliefs and political uh, relations. So um, it is uh, somehow they, they, they appear sometimes as these major ayahuasca groups as uh, moral friends, but sometimes uh, we see that they, they also can be mo moral strangers as uh, these groups can be uh, very different and have different agendas. Um, and now uh, going a little bit, a little bit to, to the introduction of bioethics. Um, this field uh, started at the, 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 the neologies, bioethics started at the 70s with the, the, with this publication, Bioethics Bridge to the Future by uh, Van Heslen Potter, uh, who was a North, North American um, biochemist, uh, uh, I don't know if he he worked with biochemistry and oncology, and he created this this term to to um, to define this this new uh, field of knowledge. Who uh, was responsible? Who was going to be responsible to act as a bridge between uh, life sciences? and human sciences, because uh, his main idea was that the life sciences uh, was, was capable of cre creating uh, technologies uh, faster than the, the ability of the human sciences to generate uh, critical reflections about the, the implications of these this, um, new technologies. So uh, bioethics will would act as a bridge between these areas because it's uh, it's also uh, known as an applied ethics. So uh, it has this focus on the life itself. Um, but uh, from the seventies until the end of the eighties. Bioethics uh, developed mainly in the global north uh, and mainly on, on based on four principles, which is known as, as principled bioethics. Uh, these four principles are uh, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice. And um, 
basically this this uh, first two decades was a period w w uh, when bioethics was were um, establishing itself as a discipline so um, later on this knowledge was imported a, a critically by uh, by countries all around the world, including the peripheric countries and the uh, the, the countries of global north, uh, including the, the countries of global north. Um, from the the late nineties, uh, bioethicists at the global south started to point that this uh, this perspective wasn't uh, although it was extremely useful in the clinical context uh, this approach this, this approach wasn't enough to meet the demands from the collective sphere in the global south so um, to give a practical example uh, it is uh, common that people participating in research in US or in, in, in some countries of Europe to earn money for this participation. Um, in uh, Brazil, for example, people can't uh, be paid to participate in research. Uh, people can only be uh, refound uh, about any costs they had but they can't earn money because this will, will produce an inequality on the risks uh, in research. So people, mo so the most vulnerable people, the most poor people would have to, to, would be exposed to the risks of research while uh, rich people and middle-class people um, won't. And would uh, and would benefit, right? So from this research, so this is an example to show why this uh, this South American bioethics, this Latin American bioethics, um, contributed to to somehow uh, contextualize bioethics to to the global South. Um, okay, uh, so um, there are a lot of um, contexts for which bioethical references can be used to reflect uh, the uses of ayahuasca. You can think on this clinical approach or this care approach in the trials with ayahuasca. We can think in this incipient uh, psychedelic science uh, that that is uh, that is uh, offering some some incipient treatments, not the not the psychedelic science, but the incipient uh, treatments that are uh, turning reality uh, and the relations that happens in this context. We can think in the in the religious and ritual context about the abuse. Uh, that were reported by many women uh, in context of uh, ayahuasca circle. Um, we can also think about the indig indigenous people. Uh, we can also think about the environment and about the, the species. So it, there are uh, both uh, two inter and transdisciplinary areas. So there are multiple uh, analysis, uh, possible analysis. So uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on this religious context um, at this part of the presentation. So as I said, I was at the bachelor uh, in biology when I first met uh, and first drink, drank ayahuasca. Uh, I went there by an invitation of a friend of mine. And uh, that was a, a very important experience for me. And, but also I was like uh, studying at this time 
I was studying research ethics and I was, uh, my attention was pretty mobilized by the, for this um, sort of biomedical um, background. And I was there like uh, thinking too much about risks and, and control. So, which are um, some of the components of this paradigm. So um, this experience was, was somehow uh, curious because when I was at, at the FORSA or uh, in ayahuasca effects, I, I questioned myself. So everyone is here. It was like a hundred people in a place. Everyone is drinking this tea. They were informed just before um this is very cool um the ceremony was was nice and things was, were going well and that called my attention so come on i wasn't experienced at, at all with with psychedelics and our, other psychedelics too so i keep asking myself so how these people <laughs> all these people drink ayahuasca and things stay cool we are not having uh, many problems. So uh, I was dealing with this hyper dimensioning of the, the risks, right? Um, so after the, 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 the experience, uh, months later, some months later, I started to uh, thinking about this research. Um, and the, the, the question that, that drive me to, to the this master's research was this one. So how, how the instruction uh, or the informed consent happen in, a, in ayahuasca groups? So I used to call them informed consents, but uh, to call this process and, and informed consent, but I when I started visiting the groups, they almost never used these terms. They used instruction, so that's why I'm, I'm I'm using this term too, uh, and I may use them as synonyms during this, this presentation. Um, so this research was a qualitative exploratory research with semi-structured questionnaires. I used the snowball sampling methodology because uh, although ayahuasca is legal in Brazil, um, the not all groups like uh, to to be too much open about their practices, they might they may be um, they may appreciate this this privacy. So it was not that that easy to find the groups in the in the region I was in the state of São Paulo. So this was uh, a strategy to access one group, and then they they will tell us about two or three more groups or people they knew that serves ayahuasca. So um, that's uh, how I, I contacted those, those groups. There was uh, 20 groups. Uh, eight of them was Santo Daime practices. Uh, 10 of them was urban shamanism practices. One of them defined themselves as interreligious practice. And one of them defines uh, themselves as Umbandaimi, which is a um, syncretism of the Santo Daimi practice with the Umbanda, which is an Afro-Brazilian religion. Um, so uh, there was this, this 20 groups. Um, and they were distributed in five Brazilian states, Mato Grosso do Sul, Pernambuco, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro and Santa Catarina, but most of them in Sao Paulo. So um, when I asked them, uh, oh, sorry, one minute. Okay, so uh, here it, I, I, I couldn't translate this, this, um, this, uh, Pietro, this is the time you came in. <laughs> Tabela. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> I'm here. 
Um, oh, please help me. Uh, what do I do? Uh, what exactly do I translate? Oh, oh, this this uh, tabela. Okay. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, columns. The first one group, uh, the second one practice. So it's divided between uh, Santo Daimi churches and Shamanismo groups. Uh, the states, uh, which means the localization here in Brazil. So we have Pernambuco, São Paulo, Mato Grosso do Sul, and Rio de Janeiro is Santa Catarina. Uh, the region, a region, okay. It's like it's like rural, rural area, urban, peripheric, and uh, and central and urban central areas. Uh, okay. I, I think I, I can go from here, and I thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, okay. So they they were distributed in different regions, also like rural area um urban area in the periphery or in the center um also the number of members uh, that were pres that were there in, in each ceremony uh variated a lot we can see small groups like with 10 people 15 12 and also groups like medium groups with 25 30 maybe let me see another with 30 and also we have large groups with um, 80 members 100 200 250 per ceremony um, and and also they variate about the the time uh, of existence of the group so there were groups that that had like one year uh, two year and also group that were like well, with seven years and 10 years and 17 years so uh, this is a pretty heterogeneous uh, sample heterogeneous sample um, and the the characterization of these groups uh, are are very diverse so um, when I asked ask them about the, the, the I, I interviewed the, the responsible, the instructor or the responsible for the instruction uh, or the leader, the religious leader. And uh, I try to characterize to who are them and a little bit of their experience with the brew. So um, most of the interviewed uh, instructor were men and their, their age variated too. We have like um, people with yeah, 23, 23 year old, like 40, 35, 50 and so on. Uh, also, they variated a lot about the schooling uh, here. There were people with primary school uh, with, um, just a minute. They, there were people with elementary school, with secondary school, uh, bachelor, and also doctoral degree. So also the schooling uh, variated a lot about uh, in this, this sample. Uh, and here uh, is the, it's the, just a minute. Here it's the time that they were using ayahuasca. So we can see there are people that we're using ayahuasca for four years, five years, uh, nine, 12, 18, 20, 32 years. So uh, this variated a lot. Here we can see also the occupations. Uh, I, uh, as you can see, 
it's very diverse. Uh, first, I believe that they were like, they were going to be psychologists or health professionals. Um, but uh, there, some of them were, but look at the, the occupations. There were a, bus a business administrator, carpenter, undergraduate student, geographer, massage therapist, driver, baker, elementary school teacher, psychologist, holistic therapist, salesman, university professor, federal justice employee, and caretaker. So uh, we, uh, as, as, as I said, uh, there were some health professionals involved, but they were not the, the most frequent. Um, and uh, now talking about the informed consent, consent it, process itself, um, first I asked ask them if they did any kind of instruction and all of them said they did. And I asked them and also saw this happening, um, what was the, the, the form of this informed consent of, or this instruction? And basically I saw three different forms, which was an, an, like an individual uh, interview with people who were uh, there for, for to take ayahuasca. I saw um, people who did the consent with small groups, um, like a, a, a group talk. And also uh, a, a place that place that had like 200 people, 250 people uh, for each ritual. Uh, they did in a in a it, it was like a lecture uh, form. So because there were too many people to to be informed, so they they used this this strategy. And also they use most of one of one. Um, like I saw people that do that did like group talks, but uh, if someone there needed to had like a, a, a personal talk, um, so they may open this possibility so people can talk more about themselves and and um, make their 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 questions. So uh, there are these different forms of doing this informed consent. And when I asked them about the anamnesis, because uh, they, people use uh, different uh, sorts of documents in this, in this uh, informed consent process, they have like, uh, it's like, um, it's like a, a, a term where, you basically agree that you're going to take ayahuasca, that you're going to follow the rules. Uh, also, they may have uh, another document for the anamnesis, uh, which um, I also asked them about. So if they, they, they did the anamnesis to know more about the, the health status, uh, about uh, mental health uh, disorders, uh, about mental disorders, about um, um, drugs, about uh, surgeries. There's there's uh, a lot of of uh, points, and uh, most uh, the most part of the groups uh, said they they did perform the anamnesis, uh, but three of them didn't, and they said that. They were like a small groups uh, with like this familiar uh, characteristic. So they, they're, it's very rare that someone new shows up to drink ayahuasca. So they, they said they, they, they wanted to do in the future, but this was not a necessity uh, at the point. Um, I also asked them about these forms, these anamnesis forms that they they keep with them, uh, if they were like uh, were 
private, private, they, they stayed in a confidential place or people could assess because there are many information there. And basically uh, everyone uh, in, in every group, um, people could stay with the people, uh, only the leaders, the religious, le religious leaders uh, hold these informations and these forms uh, but in one group, uh, the, the instructor told me that everyone could assess these this forms. And uh, in another one, um, that was uh, a group um, that was doing a work with women that, that uh, had suffered, suffered uh, sexual abuse and different forms of abuse. And there was a, a different form there because uh, they, they the women could uh, choose who of the group would be in in with would hold this these forms and this these documents. And I also asked them about the if they had any difficult or challenge to to do this instruction and this was uh, divided some of them had and some of them didn't had but i i'm going to talk about this a little bit so still on the informed consent process uh, i asked them what were the classes of provided informations and they said like i i structured like this uh with the informations they 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 used to 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 provide before during and after the experience so before the experience with ayahuasca uh, they try to tell what is ayahuasca they try to 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 build with people uh, uh, some some motivation or, or purpose to the ritual um, they bring also historical aspects so they can tell the history of ayahuasca with master Dineo in santo daimi and how ayahuasca came to the urban centers centers so um, it's like contextual contextualizing a little bit the the practice they also talk about legality um, because many people um, think this might be something um, forbidden. And although in Brazil, we have many groups and ayahuasca, uh, it's popular and it's growing in popularity. Um, it's not uncommon to find people who never heard about ayahuasca or who heard in a very stigmatized stigmatized way, so that's why they also talk about legality. Um, some some of them try to differentiate differentiate ayahuasca from a drug. Um, of course, about this this uh, because of the this moral panic around drugs, and they were on drug. Uh, they also talk about diets, um, not eating meat, um, being abstinent on sex and not in drugs. Um, other <laughs> referring to ayahuasca here, <laughs> sex and other drugs. Um, they talk a little bit about mystical manifestations, uh, the risks and contraindication, um, and about the duration of ceremony not trespass, trespassing the ceremony area, the number of doses they are going to serve. Um, and during, um, they think it's important to tell what is FORSA, uh, the effect of ayahuasca, uh, how is being on the effect of ayahuasca, and also remember that this uh, will pass. Uh, the possible effects, they talk about the cleanings, cleanings or limpeza, the purging uh, and other side effects, and also about the challenging experiences for them to be to stay calm, to breathe, 
and to ask for help of other members. And the uh, information they provide for after the ceremony, um, it's be careful when driving and uh, to possible post-use sensations and afterglow. And about the difficulties uh, they found in performing the consent, um, one of them was about the pharmaceutical drugs because uh, as we know, they, they have different uh, names when they are sold in the, in the pharmacy. So um, they sometimes have difficult uh, remember that not of all of them were prof health professionals to know which uh, medication is which and if it's danger or not to 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 mix with ayahuasca um, some of them said the language and the communication is also a challenge because uh, you have to speak in a simple way that people will understand but also there is this difficulty on defining what is the force, what is the ayahuasca experience. So it's somehow paradoxical. And also they, they found challenge, uh, challenging the, some delicate cases like people with borderline disorders or sociophobia, if uh, they could or not uh, provide an ayahuasca dose for them. Um, I also asked them for what reason uh, them, specifically them in the group were responsible for the informed consent. And they told me that uh, having communication skills uh, or uh, something related to their occupation, the academic background or being a therapist or a teacher or the long time of experience with ayahuasca the responsibility as a leader, all of them were attributed to, to these values or these characteristics of uh, performing the informed consent. And also, um, I, I asked them, how did, how did they get prepared to, to serve ayahuasca and to inform people about this practice? So, People told about the contact with senior leaders in religious groups, uh, about the contact with health professionals. It is common to, to see uh, that sometimes people who serve ayahuasca, um, they, they, they try to, they contact health professionals to, um, to question about a specific case to um, so they can they can be more uh, informed also to to care and um, they also talked about their their own experience with the use of ayahuasca the academic and professional training then uh, they they also um, reach a non-scientific journal, the, legis the legislation itself, the Brazilian le legislation about, about ayahuasca, which is the, the, the last one from 2010, the Conagi resolution. Um, they search also in internet articles, religious and spirituality literature, scientific literature, and uh, also their personal history. Um, and when I asked them what was the fact of the, of the instruction, they told me people want to know how does it feel, how is Forza, about diet, diets and purge, about pregnancy, medicines. People want to know if they are going to lose consciousness, uh, if they're lose, going to lose control, if they're going to lose their mind, uh, they, they want to know if uh, it's a drug. Uh, remember, Brazil is very, very um, 
um, affected by this drug war policy. So um, it's it's like it's important. It's a moral uh, category, right? The 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 drug. So uh, they want to know if if it causes hallucinations, uh, if they're going to be uh, that they they have fear for the unknown, fear of dealing with the shadows, fear fear of not returning, um, and also if there if you know is this a mushroom tea tea or belladonna tea? It's like this botanical preparation. What is what is this? Right? Tell me more. So um, and now. Um, Going through a, a, a quick view over the the other context of uh, ayahuasca experience, which is on uh, laboratories nowadays, um, uh, we can think about this this field of the research ethics. The this this field is a sub area of bioethics. And uh, it, it basically uh, appeared after ve uh, several vi violations uh, to human, human rights and that happened in research in the past. One of them uh, well known is the, 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 the Tuskegee Institute in the US that uh, when some where some researchers were studying the occurrence of cyclists in uh, uh, black community, and then they uh, uh, they started the, the the research when the penicillin wasn't wasn't invented, but then in the middle of the study it was like a, a long uh, study because it was like the the natural history of the disease study. And uh, in the middle of the study, the penicillin was invented and they decided not to, to give them so they could uh, understand more about the, the, the disease. So these people uh, kept a long time without, uh, without treatment that were already available and um, uh, which caused them several uh, several um, several violations. Um, but what I want to draw attention is that this area uh, basically emerged after very uh, problematic moments on research. And um, also in psychedelic science, we already had our several violations. Uh, I, I don't know if you know the work of Clancy Kevner, which is a, a North American psychologist. Uh, she studied the experience of LGBTQ uh, people in ayahuasca uh, groups. And she uh, found that uh, in, in her research, that the, uh, the one of the earliest uses of psychedelics in, in researchers in the 50s and 60s was to cure uh, gay people in conversion, in the so-called conversion, te conversion therapies. So uh, it's, it's interesting to, to, to know that this, this violations already have happened in in the context of the psychedelic science, uh, but not with ayahuasca. It, it was with LSD, uh, masculine. Uh, I think it's it's mostly LSD and 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 masculine. Uh, so, in Brazil, we have a research ethics regula regulation system, which is called a Sistema CEPI Conep. And the main uh, the main objective of this of this uh, system is to protect people uh, from the when part participating in research. So uh, each institution 
have to operate one SAP, which is the, the local unity of the system. And also we have a, a national uh, unity, which is called the CONEP. And they, uh, they evaluate, uh, like work with, uh, with indigenous people, with most vulner vulnerable people, with uh, new drugs, so testing new drugs. So uh, this is uh, an overview of the Brazilian uh, ethics regulatory system. Uh, and I also want to bring attention that when we talk about ayahuasca research and research ethics, we can think about this clinical ethics uh, that is focused on the relation of the researcher and the participant or the health professional and the, the, the people uh, seeking care. And, um, but, but also we can take a broad, broad perspective and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So when we talk about this clinical ethics, focusing on these relations, um, we are talking basically about this deontological aspects, right? They they have this this um, this um, this this form, this appearance, which is normative, right? It is uh, there are resolutions, there are laws about this, there. Are, uh, agencies um, fiscalizing. So um, also in the psychedelic field, we have uh, some contributions and specific specificities uh, that mainly basically don't occur in other areas. So one of them is the importance of screening and in, when recruiting participants, uh, it also to provide a controlled setting and also uh, good supervision during the session. Um, we can think about the mystical experiences, how someone can have a mystical experience in a laboratory and uh, this experience uh, also can have space to take place and to happen as is, is a possibility of the, the, the experience with psychedelics, right? Uh, we can think also about the, the possession, uh, monitoring and the integration, and also about this question of uh, balancing, balancing benefits and risks um, because, uh, you know, uh, when 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 you are in this this uh, screening um, time of the research, um, you have to be care careful, right, with this uh, panacea idea of psychedelic is psychedelics treating everything. So uh, it's very important to know what are the relative risks and relative benefits in uh, that that person's life, right? Uh, so uh, these are some of the, the deontological aspects of the research involving psychedelics and also uh, applied to ayahuasca. Uh, but also we can take a look at a broader perspective. Um, here I, I, I brought the, the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights from UNESCO. It's from 2005, it's a 2005 declaration. Basically, um, some bioethicists from the Global South, they were responsible for, they, 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 they uh, cont contributed a lot in the elaboration of this document. Um, because they, they advocate to expand this, um, on the, the only four principles that were, uh, that the one I mentioned, um, I mentioned it, uh, the autonomy, the, the beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy and justice, they advocated to expand this to 18 principles. 
Uh, so we have principles on human dignity and human rights, the respect for human vulnerability and individual integrity, equality, justice, and equity, respect for cultural diversity and pluralism, solidarity and cooperation, social responsibility and, at, and health, uh, the sharing of benefits, and the protection of the environment, the biosphere, and, and the biodiversity. So when we think about the, the ethics of ayahuasca research, I think it's important to somehow try to, to integrate these two dimensions, this deontological and clinical ethics that, that is uh, vital to the, to the research, to the safety, but also this research uh, is not disconnected from a world, right? It's not disconnected for, from a wor world where there are indigenous people uh, who cultivated this knowledge and, uh, and also the, the, the traditional ayahuasca religious member who also cultivated different knowledges. So uh, this uh, work in research also affect these people. Um, in the last years, for example, as uh, ayahuasca was getting more popular and the uh, scientific works with ayahuasca were in the news in Brazil, uh, people were uh, with depression or anxiety um, started to, to seek for, for this uh, experience. So um, we have to, to think on, on how this scientific work, it's uh, related to these changes and how it will affect this traditional knowledge and other ways of, uh, of caring with ayahuasca, right? So um, also um, another important point is the self-regulation. We, we talked a little bit about the, this normative ethics, these resolutions, this deontological approach, but also uh, this self-regulation is very important. There's a Brazilian sociologist called Edward McRae who studied the Santo Daime practice. And uh, when describing how the community uh, established uh, itself, how they control the substance, how they care, how they integrate the visions, the experiences, uh, how they care for each other. Um, he said that this uh, ritual uh, setting could provide like a, 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 a harm reduction effect, right? Uh, so um, this is very important too. Uh, and, and also we, we should not be that binary to divide this normative ethics and the self-regulation because Sometimes they are uh, mixed uh, as the case of the process of creating a resolution for ayahuasca in Brazil. Um, when, when they uh, did an interdisciplinary working group to study these practices and to elaborate a report on these practices so they could regulate it, um, members of this traditional uh, churches, ayahuasca Brazilian churches, um, participated in these groups and on the discussions, on the elaboration of the document. Um, we have also many uh, code of ethics in different churches around the world. So um, this seems to be like two important dimensions too of the, the experience too. Um, in, in when regulation, right? This normative ethics and the legality, and, but also the, the self-regulation and this uh, communitary-based care uh, these people built it with ayahuasca. So I also draw attention to the importance of supporting and celebrating diversity, the diversity of practice, 
practices the diversity of people, of color, of gender, sexuality in these groups. Um, there are a lot of tensions around this that are being intensely in, in, that that are uh, being debated right now in the literature and and different events, um, and also that we should. Uh, continuously draw our attention to learn from people who serve ayahuasca because they are they are doing this uh, uh, a lot for a long time and they developed a lot a lot of, a lot of uh, knowledges about this so uh, that's something important too to uh, give this this knowledge a place and to respect it right um, we also should uh, be very responsible when um, doing this scientific divulgation about ayahuasca and other psychedelics. To so we want stimulate this panacea um, and and also uh, we should build this this uh, form of education. Uh, education for an autonomous relationship with ayahuasca, um, harm reduction, benefit maximization. We see that different groups do this work. We have the, the Chakruna Institute. We have the ICRs. In Brazil, we have the Chakruna Institute, Latino, the Chakruna Latino America. We have uh, the, a group where uh, which I'm, I'm part of, which is the Ciência Psicodélica, which is also a scientific divulgation uh, group. And um, I think, but but not all not all uh, only these uh, groups that are promoting this education about uh, ayahuasca and relationship with with it, but also the groups itself. And, uh, and and many other agents in this in this debate, right? So I think it's a it's a good way to 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 work, right? So that's it. Uh, I think I'm on my time, and I'll stop the yeah the screen and. Thank you very much for the attention and I'm available for the, our talk. All right, please go ahead with the questions. If anybody has, you can just get started or raise your hand if you want, or just ask the question. Uh, I may have a question. <laughs> can I can I add something? Yeah, please go ahead. Ah, okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, question for Luis. I was wondering um, if ayahuasca will be implemented on a, a larger scale because of the therapeutic effects. I can imagine there will be also like an ethical issue related to that, uh, maybe because of like limited resources maybe because the culture where it came from is kind of appropriated maybe in a sense um could you um elaborate on what could be like a responsible future for the uh, uh uh use of ayahuasca in a therapeutic setting on a larger scale maybe maybe worldwide do you have thoughts about that well, um, I don't think I have elaborated much about this, um, but I think we have uh, we have been doing some discussions in Caro about the how to how this uh, different approaches in in psychedelic science. Like um, there are some some studies that people take ayahuasca in a hospital with. Uh, Lots of equipment and people, uh, but there are also these these uh, studies within the the called 
naturalistic setting, right? With small groups. Um, so uh, I think this is something important, right? Uh, of course, some, some cases like the major depression, uh, people with major depression from the, 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 the study, the Fernanda study, for example, may need some, some specific way of being cared, right? Uh, but maybe uh, other conditions, uh, in these other conditions may be possible to work with uh, ayahuasca in small groups, maybe uh, trying to do this, to use this community basis uh, uh, of uh, and cultural basis to to ground this this treatments. So I'm I'm thinking this more in the context of of Brazil, right? Um, and and you you also uh, you also draw attention for other very important topic, which is the 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 species, right? The the, the vegetal used to 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 do it, um, the the Benstereopscaapi and the psychotropia of villages. Um, there are there are cities which are like this this uh, uh, important uh, tourism uh, ayahuasca centers that they already uh, had difficulties in on finding the plants. Uh, because they have to to grow some years, and so I think, and and I think another perspective, like um, there's there's an indigenous leader uh, from Brazil. She's uh, from the Tucano people. She's called Dayara Tucano. Uh, she did a, a very interesting um, uh, writing on the globalization of ayahuasca. And it's important how she draw attention that uh, by the time the psychedelic science it's rocketing with many resources, uh, people, indigenous people in Brazil and other places are still being killed. They they are having their their land stolen. They are going through a genocide. So uh, I think there's no way of uh, globalizing ayahuasca or to growing the scale of these treatments and forgetting this these people so i think it's a whole uh, i don't I, I don't know much about this um, uh, indigenous perspectives so i i, I don't want to be reductionist but i think it, the, the the point is that they may offer another way of viewing it's not like resources it's the place where they live and and the plants that they they grow up with and so i think it's maybe another relation with the with the with this this point so i, I think we should uh, consider a lot of things and uh and he, hear these people right they they have to have the right to to say what they they think about the the use that we we are doing of ayahuasca, right? Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Thank you. Thank you, George. Luis, I have another question about um, you mentioned a little bit in your presentation, also in this little talk we had before. Uh, you're working with green psychedelics. But what is your experience with, um, well, I suppose global context might be a bit big, but at least within the Brazilian context of um, the LGBTQI plus uh, community in relationship with ayahuasca, or how did it, are the developments in that recently, or can you tell a bit more about your experience with that? Yes, so um, we have, uh, you know, this these religions and groups, they are in society, and we have these structural problems and questions in society, right? Um, so um, this violence, violences, and uh, they they happen in in groups. Many people uh, shared experiences about this, 
um, let me, for example, uh, some groups that they have uh, pretty much uh, 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 rigid uh, patterns of gender, for example, when about clothes, about uh, um, how people should behave and how people should be if they have to be pretty much masculine and talk with uh, this masculine voice or if uh, uh, women should be very feminine, you know, uh, there, there are these this, this patterns and uh, LGBTQA plus people uh, experience, um, uh, it's not uncommon to see this, this uh, relates, you know. Um, I, I am a bisexual man, so I have, I had my personal experience with this, this, this question. Um, I first drink, drank ayahuasca in a uh, new shamanic group, the one I told when I was in, in, uh, in undergraduation. And, uh, the place was like a colorful place with people uh, from different ages and, and seemed like a, a, a good place to stay. And I had good, good moments there, right? But um, a few months later, I started to notice that there were some meetings in, uh, in this group, some reunions to study uh, religious and spiritual practices. And uh, in these closed meetings, um, they they uh, like they expressed views and beliefs that uh, excluded uh, that that were heteronormative, right? That excluded LGBT uh, people, like from the possibility of uh, a quote. <laughs> the possibility of illuminating because they wouldn't be in a hetero, in a straight relationship. Um, so these violences, they are not all the time expressed in an in banner in front of the group, right? Sometimes you just find them during your experience there. So uh, that, we, me and my, my friend Pietro, we are um, thinking about this question and we, we call this, this experience as the second page because in the first page it's colorful and psychedelic and countercultural and but in the second page it's like heteronormative world. Yeah. So, um, so there are many ways of uh, suffering this, this, this violences. Um, there are also some groups that have LGBTQA plus leaders um, that, that uh, or that are very uh, and ex expressively uh, uh, care about uh, LGBTQ plus people there. Um, but that's it. It's it's something that uh, people may experience in the in when when uh, going to a group. So this is something. Uh, I think it's something about uh, first about ethics, right? About the care ethics. This these people are 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 offering because uh, you know if you can't be yourself, you, if you can't. Uh, talk about your issues, if you can uh, be in a comfortable and safe place to go through such uh, deep, deep experiences and profound experiences. Uh, so I think uh, we have a problem, right? We, we, we are not equal. Um, so I think we, we should pay attention in this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I find it interesting because exactly what you were saying with the strict gender norms. Um, well, yeah, we we know it here. I think we talked about it in sure a couple of times. But for example, with Santo Daimi, one of the reasons why in the Netherlands you have, of course, a mainly Santo Daimi community with ayahuasca, 
some of the reasons I also being a queer person don't feel very comfortable there is because of these strict gender norms, especially, right? Um, I'm not sure if this is specifically something that I need, but I recall some of these more religious um, kind of churches in Brazil really enforcing very strict gender roles, really like skirts for the one and pants for the other, and like blah, blah, blah. And you have this whole situation. But um, but yeah, it's interesting to hear that you're saying that there's also LGBTQI, are these like also providing, uh, how do you say this, profiling themselves uh, specifically for LGBTQI plus people, these groups in Brazil? I can imagine that especially for the LGBTQI plus community, also with mental health issues being relatively very high there actually compared to the regular uh, population that psychedelics could be, uh, um, or ayahuasca in this case, could be a very helpful, uh, or it should be something in relationship to mental health also geared towards them, right? But um, yeah, if I understand correctly, there are actually these groups now forming in Brazil also addressing this issue. Or Yes, yes. Yeah, that's cool, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. <clears throat> Any last minute questions for speaker? Otherwise. Yes. Hi, Hi. Luis. Thank you very much for your amazing presentation. Uh, I'm Paloma. I am also a researcher of ayahuasca. I'm from Colombia. Uh, yeah, Latin American uh, researchers here. Uh, yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, how do you see uh, the relationship between ayahuasca and bioethics being applied to uh, creating safe spaces for women in, in, uh, in ayahuasca ceremonies? Uh, could you please repeat, Paloma? Yes. Uh, how do you see ayahuasca and bioethics creating like... Um, a relationship to create a safe space for women in ayahuasca ceremonies. Okay, um, there's uh, th there are some groups that are discussing this. Thank you for for your, your questions. Really good to be here with you. Um, I, I think you you probably probably know about the the Chacruna work. They are uh, constru constructing this debate, um, but specifically about the bioethics. I think the the I think the most important contribution uh, may come from the care ethics, which is this uh, field of ethics, uh, which started with uh, feminists um, and and. It, 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 it likes uh, changes a little bit this, um, this long tradition in ethics, which is a co cognitivist tradition that tries to, to, to keep emotions and keep feelings out of the, the table uh, and establish it uh, like the uh, and, and justice ethics with uh, being uh, like an impersonal and abstract values of justice. So the, the, the care ethics uh, brings uh, in, in, in complementary uh, perspective, but drawing attention to the relations. So how are people in these relations, how they are mutually uh, experiencing these relations. Uh, how do, do we um, how do, do we actually um, what are what is the notion of care we are having when when relating, right? Um, so 
I think this perspective uh, may, may, may be a good contribution as uh, it like uh, opens this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this notion, right? Of uh, not only like having a, a, a form, now, you know, we are here in this group, we are uh, anti-fastest, we are this and this and this and that, but then we, you see everything going <laughs> there, you know, every kind, every sort of violences and abuses. And so I think uh, it's an important part of it to, to discuss this and to um, talk about these value, values, but also um, we have to keep this, this uh, uh, constant look at the, these relations and, and how are people feeling and how are being people, how uh, people are being cared. So I don't know if I uh, answered you, but uh, that's what I, I elaborated so on. Thank you for your question, Paloma. And if you want to, to contribute, it would be amazing. Thank you very much, Luis, for your presentation and for your answer. Thank you. I kind of have um, another question because you were mainly talking now, or well, your, your research was uh, conducted in the um, mainly the Brazilian context, where of course it was also being quite big, I suppose, in Brazil. Um, but also with like the project you're in, like Ikado, um, what is the relationship with, or are you in relationship with also um, other Latin American countries or mainly Hispanic speaking countries, I suppose, that include Amazon? which also have um, a history of ayahuasca use and still have certain groups uh, historically related to ayahuasca use about mainly then topics like uh, ethics or is it like really more, in, how do you say this, like intra-Brazilian um, kind of discussion being held or are you guys in contact with a lot of other countries as well? Your neighboring no, so, so on, I'm, I'm focusing this, this research in two different contexts, which is the, the religious context and the scientific context, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm doing some uh, study cases um, to understand how they, they produce just this care and this notion of what is ethics for them and how they operate this on, on internally. So, I had to 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 do this this focus right in in this context because uh, that's uh, something I'm I'm trying to understand better how th this this uh, this path of the intermedicalities uh, and on how this sort of uh, biomedical ethics. Uh, how it relates with this religious ethics because uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's not like a, an, um, an equal uh, relation regarding the power, right? So uh, it's a very unequal relation. So especially in, in the global south. So I think um, the, I'm, I'm trying to, to focus on, on this uh, bridge between this health sciences and the, the, the ritual uh, world. Do we have any other questions? No, because otherwise I think uh, Marco, if you agree, if you can react. Um, yeah, I think it sounds good. Um, thank you again, Luis, for the presentation and everybody for joining and, and asking some interesting questions. And if we have one more event in, in four days, I think, you can find on uh, either two. Oh, sorry. Oh, we have two more. Sorry, my bad. Two more. 
Yes. Um, that's an interesting panel discussion. Helle actually joined us <laughs> for a little bit. Right. We have one on the 23rd. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have one this Saturday and then one on Monday mm -hmm. evening. Same time. Uh, so hope to see you guys there and I hope you have enjoyed these events and these talks so far. All right. And thank you, Brian, uh, for inviting the speaker. And thank you, Luis, for giving this talk. Thank you very much for inviting me. And we'll see again. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to join the next talks, Luis, would be, uh, if you want. It would be nice to have you. Yes, there. for sure. It, it will be Paloma's talk, right? Uh, I think we, no, we have a panel. We have uh, Helle. Oh, yeah, the panel. Oh, I'm in this panel. <laughs> That really, it would be better if you're there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So, great Thank you very much. Bye, very everyone. Nice. Have a good evening. Bye, guys.